you are listening to JS Party, the award-winning weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. What up, nerds? Have you heard? I have a new project I'd love you to check out. It's called Changelog News, a first-of-its-kind weekly podcast plus newsletter combo. Big, big combo. I'll tell you more about it in one of the breaks. Thanks to our friends at Fastly for shipping our shows super fast all around the world. Check them out at Fastly.com. And to our partners at Fly. Deploy your app servers and database close to your users. No ops required. Check them out at Fly.io. Okay, hey, it's party time, y'all. me jared and i am here with my friend chris what's up chris what's up how you doing happy to see you once again i'm doing all right how are you doing i'm just great <laughs> sarcasm detected for ross is also here what's up Ross? how's it going jared it's always good to have you on the pod and we are joined by a special guest bradley farias His friends call him bubbles enemies call him bubbles maybe even Bradley works with Feroz at Socket. Bradley, welcome to JS Party. Hey, good to be here. Happy to have you as well. We're here to talk about some of your recent work on accomplishing the impossible, which is taking NPM and making it not dangerous, making it safe. You guys recently announced this CLI tool from Socket, Safe NPM or NPM Safe, depending on your affectation, or just Socket NPM, if you will. And we're here to talk about, we want to learn about how it works, why you built it, how you built it, maybe dive into some of the details. Hopefully, we can learn a little bit more along the way about how NPM works, the command line, how NPX works, why they're dangerous, and so on. So maybe we start off with that. NPM install, something we've all typed hundreds of times, most likely. Maybe even every day. Yeah. (laughs) It, It turns out, and by the way, spoiler alert, NPM uninstall also... Uh, fraught with danger, which I learned as reading your guys' announcement. I didn't realize it could install things. It's supposed to uninstall things. Anyways, we'll save that for later. Let's start with npm install, uh, why it's problematic, and what y'all have been doing to fix that. Take it away, Brad. Sure. So I was trying to figure out a little bit how to satisfy some customer stuff at Socket. We were seeing questions about how developer machines could be protected. Most of our product at Socket uh, was done through GitHub analysis. You've done plenty of shows where people have kind of GitHub CI workflows and things like that. But people were asking, what do we do when we have an install script or security problem on a developer machine? This was a real world incident. as well. It happens every so often, every few years, I think developer machines have a fairly big incident from NPM. And the question came up, well, why are things running on your machine? And generally that's going to be when you run NPM install, it might run install scripts or it might install malware directly onto your machine. Both are possible. And so we had to spend time trying to understand all the ways people are using NPM on a daily basis. And so we had to basically write something that would let a developer transparently still type NPM install on their machine. They wouldn't need to update any code, but it would add protections. So we wrote a wrapper script around NPM in a way that would allow it to be used transparently while we injected essentially some stopping points where we could do some checks. And so we actually will check for risk and things to let people make that decision when it occurs. It'll show the person the risk in your terminal after you type npm install. It'll be like, oh, this has a CVE, this is a typo squat, this has install scripts. And it just gives developers a way to pause and understand what they're about to do is risky and even let them cancel everything. Okay. 
So to make sure I'm tracking here, so Socket has all these threat detection tools that you all have built. And it does static analysis, it does other things, looking for typo squats, and has this corpus of knowledge about NPM packages and their level of safety or danger or just what it thinks about them. And there's like a ranking and all that kind of stuff. And that's all well and good for people who run it against their GitHub repos. Because if there's a problem inside your repo when you push it to GitHub, then Sock is going to help you in that way, right, For us, Yeah, it'll show up on the pull request as a GitHub check. Before. Right, but there's this other threat vector, which is the actual developer's machine themselves. And you can also be attacked on your machine, not on your GitHub repo. And so now when I'm running the NPM, whatever, I'm letting somebody else's code execute on my machine. And that can cause all sorts of other problems, such as, well, they can just run arbitrary code on my machine. Once they can do that, of course, they've hacked me locally, but they, then they can also take that power and leak my information or get you know production credentials off my machine, et cetera, to hack servers. And so this tool is still using that same corpus of knowledge that you guys have built with Socket, and it's extending where it works. So now it works as a wrapper for NPM. Am I understanding? Is that all right, correct? Am I, for us, am I understanding everything? Yeah, that's exactly correct. So it transparently wraps the NPM command and and you can continue then using NPM in the same way that you normally do. And if there's no risks, we won't we won't interrupt the installation process. It'll work just like it normally does. But in that, you know, small percentage of cases where there's something you want to know about, it'll it'll um give you a speed bump and ask you if you're really sure. And I suppose this is like configurable and so I can say no, I actually don't care about this stupid CVE. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, so CV, it's funny you mentioned CVEs because we don't even we don't actually warn about CVEs by default, just because it's that's the typical reaction of the developer community. So CVEs are not the the focus of Socket right now, even though we do like have all that same information that that you get from npm audit or or GitHub's advisory database. Yeah, the, the, fortunately, the typical reaction of developers to seeing, you know, CVE information is like, ah, yeah, I already know I got like hundreds of those. So, yeah, you've seen plenty of NPM audit reports, but they do check CVEs, but they always just tell you you already ran the code that has the problem. So that's their normal behavior. So we're trying to move the like knowledge forward yeah before you install the dangerous thing not telling you you already did something dangerous and to add to that too like we're looking for stuff that doesn't you know isn't even covered by cves because when you have a supply chain attack it's not in a cve it's usually it's you know some package is compromised and nobody knows it yet and so you know anyone who's unlucky enough to install it you know for that period when it's when it's full of malware is going to have a sad a really sad day uh <laughs> And so, you know, th that's that's why we want to step in and and let let people know what's in those packages before they install them. And so one of the things that it will do then is if there's a new lifecycle script, like a post and sell script, it will tell you, right? So this is a little interesting. So if you use install scripts, we treat all install scripts as effectively equivalent because you can run arbitrary code. So if you can run arbitrary code, a pre-install versus post-install, if they change from pre-install to also having a post-install, we will not give you a new alert because you're already running arbitrary code when you run it. So there's a bunch of things that you might initially think are great to warn developers about, but it makes the tool completely unusable. Every time you add that speed bump, so you see this in other tools as well. Like they will add a speed bump every single time you install something that has say an install script. And you know it has an install script. <laughs> Some of the most popular packages on NPM have install scripts. But after you've already run the risky thing, you're effectively already hosed if you didn't agree with it before. So we're only gonna alert you if something has changed. And for particularly install scripts, if they add an install script and they didn't have any before, that's something to be worried about. But there's not really a change in risk, actually, if you just change from pre-install to post-install or something like that. 
Right. Yeah. Th- that was that was too lengthy. Yes, you yeah, answered sorry. my question, but I asked it. I asked it incorrectly. <laughs> I think so. Okay, ask it the right way this time. Well, no, no, he answered it. It, it was. Okay. It was. Uh, you know, does it alert if if somebody like adds a new script where they never had one before? That's right. And that's you know, that's what I meant. Yeah, but there's a real like we spent actually way more time than I loved on trying to get the developer actually able to use this tool every day. And so it's really like detailed in how you have to approach meeting the developer where they're at. Like that's the key thing I think for this rollout that we've had. We've had this feedback period and developers have shown us problems with us over alerting or under alerting and everybody wants different things, which is interesting to see. And you've got to find that default middle ground. When you say everybody wants different things, you're meaning like their appetite for being interrupted or being talked to is is dramatically different or varying so that some developers are like, leave me alone unless this is an absolute emergency. And other people are like, actually, I really appreciate being interrupted every time a install script changes or every time. An, is that what you're saying? Like people just care about different things? Yeah, so they care about different categories of issues is one. Some people aren't so concerned with things like licensing or stuff like that. Others really want everything. They want any, even the most minute of issues. Just the install script has changed like one string in it. They want to stop what they're doing until their security team can audit it, which is vastly different i think than most developers who need to be able to you know install a react component or something and get their day-to-day work done yeah chris what's your appetite in this way i'm kind of a leave me alone kind of person um yeah i mean i've just been it's just been way too noisy jaded yeah so yeah i'm just jaded and just like all of this is baloney i don't really care about any of it and i mean yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm not the right person to ask. <laughs> Part of the problem with most of the security tooling, in my opinion, is that by focusing on these these vulnerabilities, these are all theoretically going to affect you, right? But they're not actually, you know, all affecting you in a real way. They're all like potential ways that your app could get attacked or right. could get compromised, and. The problem with the, there's a lot of problems with the CVE system, but the fundamental problem is they're all theoretical, like problems in your app. And not to mention like the severities are all really inflated on the reports. So everything is basically critical or high because in the, if you use it in the exact correct way, it could be really, really bad, right? But it's probably not used that way. The vast majority of these are just not going to affect you. So I don't want to I don't want to downplay like I mean obviously there are very significant CVEs that can be a big deal for you but just if you just look at the kind of hundreds of warnings that you get on on npm audit right like how many of those are actually affecting you or are going to lead to your application getting compromised it's like you know it's very small percentage of those and so that's the key like original sin or whatever of of a lot of the security tooling which is why we've focused almost entirely on supply chain attacks and malware and stuff that basically if you have one of those in your in one of your dependencies you will not be upset that we told you about it you will not see it as like an interruption or you right. know, like or or like you know why is this tool annoying me like that's the stuff we're looking for so it's pretty different i think build what people need not what they want right <laughs> so yeah and It's interesting to hear you say that because what you want will drastically change once you get it. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) So one thing that this tool does that most other tools aren't doing this socket NPM is it actually compares what's on disk already. Most tools that you use, they want big numbers. They want to scare the people. They want to like be like, yeah, we're providing value by blocking your developers. And that's not, really what needs to happen we're not trying to scare people we're trying to let them just like oh you fat fingered the name of a package you're going to install i did this last week and 
it stopped me. It was like, that's a typo. But there was a package on NPM with that that did things and it stopped it. That I'm appreciative for. But once you have like, oh, I want all the warnings in the world, you really start to understand that all these security researchers are given value by overinflating everything. Every single possible way you can do prototype pollution is critical. That's probably not true. Why aren't you using this like uh, fuzzing library in your testing or stuff like that? And those don't actually affect that many people. They do affect some, but for your day-to-day -day developer, there's actually much lower hanging fruit that malware authors are going to write towards. There's no reason for them to go to those extremes normally. Yeah. I mean, when I was, when, when like NPM audit first came out and, and, and sneak and all that, I was like, Ooh, cool. Like, look at all this stuff. But you know, I wanted to see all the things that were wrong and I wanted to fix them, but that got old really quick. Oh yeah. So, but yeah, I'm, which is why you're jaded, which is why I'm jaded. And I'm yeah. with you. And this is one of the things I told you for us from the very beginning. I think when you came on the change log and talked about socket is like, you need, you need to be very careful with your false positives because you only have our attention, our interest, our patience for so long as a tool until we just completely write you off. And low context security tools that don't understand that that vulnerability is only run as a transitive dependency for Webpack, which only operates during builds of this thing and never runs in production at all. Like how many times I have to tell a tool that eventually I'm just completely done with that tool. I just, it doesn't, it's just noise in my life. And so it's a challenge, I think, where you guys sit because we have years and years and years of these types of tools, meaning security tools that have been providing not much value because they've had very little context into what I'm actually doing. And your opportunity with Socket is like, you can not be that, but then you also have to have that value moment that Brad just described when it saves you from a typo squat, when it saves you from this thing. And like those happen very infrequently and which is great. Like we, you know, you're not, you don't want to be vulnerable all the time. You don't want to be constantly being attacked, but when you do, you finally have that aha moment and you're like, okay, I get it. But it doesn't happen all that often. The developers who are asking you to give me all the warnings and all the license things and all this and all that, they're going to get sick of it. Maybe, but uh, <laughs> there are companies that truly are like heavily security auditing sure. everything they've run. I mean, then I, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know about who you're like targeting for, you know, your customer base or anything. So, but yeah, maybe you focus on those people. Maybe you have a one for, for somebody else. That is normal, All right? Or strike a balance. I think the balance is like we want to have, we want to be, we want to like focus on the stuff that's most significant out of the box and keep the alert level really, really low, so that every developer can just install this and have it as like a security blanket. You know, like a like kind of like how once you start using ESLint to catch, I, I don't know, if you guys use ESLint to catch like bugs not just the style stuff, but like the actual kind of bug catching features of it. Once you have that, or even TypeScript is a better example these days, like you sort of feel unsafe when you're like programming without it because you're like, oh, well, this would have caught this type of this class of bug that I now am not like getting protected from. So it, but it, you don't want it to get in the way. So that's kind of the way we want it to work out of the box. And then if, if some team is like really paranoid and says, you know what, like we want to be warned about every time a package you know, reads a file, uses the FS module to read a file on my disk. Like, just tell, warn me about that. We can let them configure it that way if they want sure. to, but that's not going to be how it works by default ever. Oh, that would make me cry in <laughs> most situations. If people don't understand how many times people are writing the files. What's up, party people? Jared here. Hey, I made a thing. It's called Changelog News, a podcast and newsletter combo I ship out on Mondays. The podcast episodes are 10 minutes or less, entertaining, I hope, and always on point. 
The companion email includes the five big stories covered in audio, plus a slew of other interesting links with commentary from me. I put a lot of love into this project and people really seem to enjoy it. You can listen to Changelog News by subscribing to the Changelog podcast. To get in on the newsletter, just head to changelog.com slash news and pop in your email address. It's free, it's easy, and it's pretty stinking good if you ask me. But you don't have to take my word for it. Just ask one of the 20,000-ish readers who've already subscribed. Once again, that's changelog.com slash news. I'll put the link in your show notes and chapter data. Okay, let's get back to it. So when you set out, Brad, to write this wrapper program, surely there was, I mean, we can tell how much thought you put into even just the way that it operates, but actually getting it to do what it does how do you build something like that? I assume this is a binary that you install and then you run it and then it calls NPM or shells out or something and kind of, you know, it wraps. It's a wrapper library. We know that much. Uh, how do you build such a thing? So it actually went through around three iterations and three different attempts to do this. The first attempt was, okay, we will match NPM's interface. We'll make our own CLI. It'll have the same commands. That's a lot of maintenance, especially if NPM updates. So this thing needs to work with multiple versions of NPM. It needs to work on old NPMs. It needs to work on new NPMs. So that was scrapped pretty quickly. The next kind of attempt we did was, okay, what if we just invoke the NPM CLI? It has a dry run mode built by default. Maybe we could invoke it twice, once in dry run mode, once without dry run mode. So this actually doesn't provide enough information for you to have a good user experience. It won't tell you exactly what's being installed. It'll tell you the number. It actually has all the data. You just can't get it out of the CLI for what it's about to do or would do in a dry run mode. So after that, we reached, once again, a level deeper and we actually wrote a wrapper script that will still invoke NPM, but it rips out a piece of NPM and replaces it with our like dry run wrapper that will run in a dry run mode before it does any sort of real behavior that writes to disk. This was actually fairly pleasant to write compared to some other ecosystems or package managers. We looked at a few plugin systems on other package managers. NPM actually was in a unique infrastructure position here where they use a library called Arborist, and we only really needed to replace Arborist, it looked like. So we just had to swap out Arborist, which is what it does. If you set your log level really high, you'll see this little thing logged called build ideal tree. That is where NPM does a full resolution of the entire module graph before it does any sort of removal of packages or installation of new packages. And that is the only thing we really needed to replace with our first iteration of this. And so Node happily uses CommonJS here. <laughs> this would be very hard if NPM was written in ES modules. Why is that? So mocking ES modules, I spent a lot of time. I was on TC39. I helped write the loader spec for Node. There's a variety of reasons. We actually have a spawn sync call at the front of our wrapper to invoke an ES only, ES module only package to do something. It has like timing issues. It's very hard to mock and has some memory leaks. Let's go with, it's very lucky that NPM is still writing common JS. And, and so basically you, you load the entry point and then you monkey patch and then that's it. We actually monkey patch before the entry point occurs. And that's where the timing is problematic for ES modules. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So there's no way for them to really stop us. Well, yeah, I mean... That's how like the module level mocking tools work anyway in CJS. You don't you you're careful not to load the thing, and then you configure it, and then then you tell it to load, and it swaps it out, right? Mm. So the full dry run move was that your second iteration, or that's still happening now, like with your released version? 
Ooh, so this is, it's a little bit mixed now in our third iteration. The second one was we tried a full dry run. We would just invoke the NPM CLI using hyphen hyphen dry run. This is kind of the recommended way to do it by NPM configuration currently. But it just tells you it added X number of packages and removed X number of packages. That's the only information you can get out of the CLI. I see. You don't know what was removed or what was added, which can get really confusing because what's removed and added can actually be the same package name. So Arborist is what we're using now in the third iteration, not the CLI. And we do a dry run with Arborist. And it gives you a full list of where things are going to be installed, what used to be there. So if you're updating, say you are patching a CVE or something, if you're updating, you can see the previous version and the new version. And so we do this dry run. And then after we get all the package version information of what's new, what's old, we actually synchronize that up to our API and then throw away actually the dry run. We don't use it again. NPM has some global state going on. A lot of NPM's code base is not really built to be hooked into. And so we have to throw away that tree, even though it did a bunch of work and do a effectively fresh install and make sure it's only going to install what it said it would in the dry run. Did you ever consider trying to do something like swapping out FS and then having like a virtual file system or anything like that? I've thought about it, but having done that in the past, no. Let's go with no. <laughs> Fair enough. Did there be dragons or what? Yeah. So I have a like 2014 conference talk about writing an archive loader for Node, similar to what Electron does with ASAR files. Virtual file systems are very hard to write in a way where you won't get into edge cases. It's much easier for us to intercept and take over a whole library because we're not changing how they're writing to disk. We just don't want them to touch the disk at all. So anything they do to disk would get really complicated really fast. We'd have to understand how their cache system works because they synchronize tarballs down. We'd have to prevent them from even downloading the tarball anyway because we don't want to download malware at all. So now we're intercepting FS calls too also with HTTPS calls. So yeah, it gets super complicated. So the dry run doesn't grab the tarball at all? No, it only needs the metadata information to do version right. resolution. The, what is it called? The pack of pack of fast? <laughs> Pacument, Pacument is what they normally call it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Who called it that and why? I need to speak to the manager. <laughs> so is there a perceived or even maybe not tangible, but still there performance hit with running this wrapper? Because it seems like you're doing some dancing before I actually get my commands called. There's some, there is a cache going on in NPM. So it's not as big as doing the two different runs of a CLI. But I'd say the most common thing I see is we encounter some really wild versions or packages we haven't crawled at socket yet. And it has to pause if it encounters like a package we've never seen before waiting on the API to do a full like transitive crawl, checking all the dependencies of it. It doesn't take very long, but you might see like a spinner as it counts down the number of like transitive dependencies it's trying to analyze. I was doing it this morning on one of ours, and it was like 2,500 packages on a clean install to be analyzed. And so you just see this number just going down as fast as you can. But it's it's visible, the performance loss when you do that. I want to say, the, though, that one of the benefits of the, like the approach we took at Socket is that the analysis isn't happening locally on your machine. So when we do an analysis of a package, it's done on our servers, and that way we can cache the results for everybody. So when you request, you know, a result when the CLI requests these results from the server, most of them are cached. But like Bradley said, we're not doing it for we're not pre-analyzing 
every single package on NPM yet, just because that would be incredibly expensive. We've done kind of a pre-analysis on every latest version of every package over, I think, over 500 weekly downloads. So that's almost everything that you would install uh, by typing npm install. But if you do have some like random old version of a package in your in your lock file, um, it might be the first time we're seeing it. So we'll analyze it and then save the results, and then it'll be fast after that for everybody else, and including you too. That's how we designed it. That's also necessary so that we don't have to download malware tarballs onto your local machine. We have to do it remotely. Makes sense. So as an end user, though, I have two APIs. I'm basically reliant upon being readily available and fast. I have to have Sockets API, and then I have to have NPM as well. And so potentially I have two points of failure for my stuff getting installed. Chris, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, is this is this like a open source project or what? It is open source. We're not trying to make it generic yet. We have some designs on making things generic. We actually had to do a major UX tweak in the last week. So in particular around how people are using NPX or NPM exec, I don't know if you're using those in your install scripts, but a bunch of people are apparently. So even if it's open source, it's a little unstable while we figure out all the interesting use cases in the open source ecosystem. We use that. So there's like a, a life cycle script to do a clean reinstall of everything, right? And um, we want to rim wrap some stuff. And so I don't have node modules. So I use NPX rim wrap, right? Yeah. So we'll still intercept that. We've always intercepted that. But by default, there is no ability from NPM to prompt and tell you you're about to install something. So NPX will blindly install it. <laughs> Normally it'll prompt you, oh, do you want to install RimRaf? But if it doesn't have a terminal to prompt you over standard in, it'll just blindly install regardless. Mm, that sounds like a security possible problematic. We used to error on it, but this week we pushed an update we have it on our blog post. We had to like put down an inner process communication server and synchronize terminals. This isn't too uncommon in things like VS Code do it, but it was just something that we weren't expecting to do. We thought an error would be enough, but too many people are using MPX and install scripts even. So, yeah. Wait, what did you do? Oh, there are a lot of... <laughs> There are a lot of people who install things in their pre and post install scripts. Wait, what? What is this? Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, you said something about IPC and and, and something. I'm like, what? What? Are, well, yeah. Oh, that part. Yeah. So basically, the problem is, npm normally will use a pipe and not standard I/O when it spawns child processes for pre and post install scripts. So you can't actually. Be like, please tell me if you're okay with all these risks you're about to do. Right. NPM would just log it to a file, basically, if you wanted. You can change that behavior using hyphen hyphen foreground scripts, and then it won't use a pipe. It'll inherit standard I.O. to the child processes. But if you do that, it has a lot of weird effects, like it suddenly can't do install scripts in parallel. You get a lot of garbage printed to your console because people are putting debug things in their pre and post install scripts. Or, or uh, asking for donations. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Mm. It's a lot of install scripts doing that. So we had to put essentially a server down on disk, which gets connected to by finding an environment variable. And it basically says, hey, I need to capture standard I.O., and it tells that to the root process doing the original NPM install. And so once it captures it, then it can talk over standard IO through the root process. Wow, that's a pain in the butt. It's not too uncommon in a GUI world, but I think it would be nice if more tools allowed this. And the whole reason MPX has that security concern is because it doesn't want to do this handshake.
Do you find yourself itching to grow at work, but you're not getting the support you need from your manager? Or maybe you're at a career transition and trying to figure out what you want and how to get it. Or you've got a great job, but could use an external perspective on some tricky cross-functional relationships. Hi, this is K-Ball from JS Party, and these are the exact types of problems I'm helping folks with in my new business. I think about it as pair programming for non-technical problems. If you're curious, you can learn more and sign up for a free exploratory session at kball.llc slash coaching. Let's take it back to the basics for a moment for those of us who are just thinking about, well, maybe I would use this, right? But maybe I'm just a person who uses NPM from the command line and NPX. I don't know very much about them. And I'm thinking like, how would I eat? What's a wrapper program? How would I, what would I do in order to make my NPM safe? Like with regards to this program, just give us the, like the ABCs of using it. Let's see. The first thing you do is install our command line. So it'd be like npm install at socket security slash CLI. Dash G. Dash G. Because you're gangsta. Well, if you if you want it to be global, yeah. Well, that's what that means. I always thought it was the gangsta flag. I always drop <laughs> the gangsta on there. <laughs> yeah. And from there, make sure that the socket command is in your path. If it's dash G, that'll be true. And then you can, we made sure it works with command aliasing. So you just, if you're in Unix, do alias npm equals socket space npm, and then alias npx equals socket space npx, and then do everything normally. You don't have to update your code base or anything. No API key or anything like that? Uh, not for the defaults, no. So if you want other things like org settings, then you're going to need an API key. It's just too easy for us. It's just too easy. Yeah, we like to make things easy. We like know that developers don't want to futz with stuff when it comes to this. So just got to make it easy. Got to make, make it really straightforward. What if I already have an alias in there that says npm equals yarn? <laughs> then is, this gonna, is it going to chain? It's just going to work magically? I'm pretty sure it's not going to work with yarn, is it? No, we looked at Yarn's plugin system and it didn't have quite the right information that we wanted. PNPM just put up a PR yesterday to add the hooks we need. I have to double check them today. Mm. But are people using Yarn still? Do you guys know the numbers on Yarn? I mean, which one? Which number? Which Yarn? How many Yarns are there? Uh, so I counted six different integrations we'd have to do to support. Just if you say the word Yarn. Okay. We'd have to write like six different things. But officially, there's three versions that everyone uses, right? Kind like, of? Like, I mean, well, there's, there's three I'd say versions. five. There's five. Five officially, because you have PNP mode, which is, I, I would actually separate out. Is it worth all that effort for us? I mean, you're the businessman. Are you guys going to, is this worth it for the business? It's one of the most updated feature requests, or most yeah. upvoted. Yeah. Yeah. People, people really like Yarn, in, especially in big companies like, a lot of customers are using Yarn. I think we haven't committed to doing it yet, but I mean, if enough people keep asking us for it, like Bradley said, it's it's like one of our top upvoted requests, which is, by the way, it's always fun when, you know, you work super hard on a feature like this safe NPM, and then you put it out there, and the first thing you get is, can you make it work in Yarn? Can you make it work in PNPM? Can you make it work here? And it's like, you know, uh, I mean, obviously we'll do it eventually, but yeah, it's, you know, people always ask for the, you know, the next thing. <laughs> We also have other languages, and some of the other languages will be fairly easy once we get all the user experience story ironed out with this just one integration. But Python package management is a whole other story. Uh, I was going to make a joke about <laughs> Python. <laughs> Go ahead, let's hear it. Just like, you know, 500 integrations, and, you know. Right. People like to make fun of JavaScript for, you know, being crazy and yeah it's really eye-opening to look at the other ecosystems and realize actually we have it pretty good in javascript you know we have our package uh, dependency you know format is a json file you know it's, it's easy to parse it it's really straightforward and everyone else or not everyone else but a lot of other ecosystems have basically these arbitrary files where you can run anything in there and it's just a convention that they follow a certain format but theoretically you know you could have 
you know, code doing anything in there, like looping and if statements and HTTP requests in the file that declares the dependencies, right? So that's craziness. That's, yeah, we have it pretty good in, in JavaScript land, I think. Well, speaking of craziness, riddle me this, guys. Why would npm uninstall ever install packages? Uh, yeah, this was a surprise. Um, <laughs> this is what got okay. me the best. Can I answer? Can I? Oh, answer? Chris knows why. I want to try. I want to try. Go okay, ahead. go ahead. Because you can add a uninstall or post uninstall or pre uninstall lifecycle script that does literally anything, right? That's one, but that's not the surprising one. Okay, what's the surprising one? So sometimes you have two dependencies that depend upon a third dependency. So we're going to say A and B are two dependencies. They all depend on C. But A wants the 1.1.x, so you're stuck on 1.1. But B wants anything greater than 1.0. So that means B can install 1.2, but not while A is installed. So if you remove A, NPM, I said earlier, builds the ideal tree, the like perfect version of the world. And then it sees, oh, I could actually install a newer version of C because A is gone. And so removing A updates and installs a new version of C which can then install, you know, more dependencies that never existed before or whatever. I, I wonder if this is why if you went and you and you did an npm link and then you go and you run npm install or uninstall on something else, it kills all your sim links and you have to do it all over again. But I have a question, Bradley. Like, didn't, didn't, we, didn't npm used to in the old days just, you know, install in that situation? Wouldn't it just install two versions of C? and give A the one it wants and give B the best one that it wants to. So you'd have two copies of C. Oh, now we're getting into package manager fights. Yes, it originally did that. <laughs> and then people saw Yarn and Yarn deduped like this does. So NPM adopted that behavior. And now we're seeing NPM responding to PNPMs, kind of global shared cache as well. And it added that like two months ago or something. And so it's an ever evolving thing. And so the only way to keep up to date is to get these hooks in some way. And we declare like, this is the data we need. And we write them to each integration. It's unfortunate that NPM was never really built to be extended. Maybe, but even with these plugin systems on other package managers, we're having to go and change the hooks. So it's hard to know what hooks you actually need until you write an actual thing to use them. And a lot of the times people are using the hooks for things and they aren't respecting what users have already installed on disk. That's a big thing. We've been talking to a couple of package managers about this and they were surprised that we want to know what's already on disk. So that's not usually in the plugin system. So this affects your version of NPM because it can't simply say you're uninstalling. So you should not ever install anything because that's actually a legitimate NPM feature. You know, whether it's misguided or not, it's a real feature of the package manager. And so now you have to be able to, I guess, what? Watch what it's doing at uninstall and making sure that it doesn't install things it shouldn't be, but can install things it should be? Or do you just punt? How do you deal with that? Yeah, so NPM was probably the easiest to do even without a plugin system, this. So Arborist, their library for basically doing all the version resolution and building your ideal tree, will show you any operation it's about to do. Anything it's going to remove, anything it's going to add, and anything it's going to update. And so instead of checking for this is an install or uninstall command being run, we always just completely take over Arborist. And whenever Arborist generates a installation or a update, that kind of stuff, that is what we're checking against. 
we have no consideration for the commands. There are so many ways to install stuff using npm. npm ci, npm install, npm update, npm uninstall. <laughs> yeah. So help me understand if I understand this correctly. When you install socket npm, are you taking your custom arborist, are you monkey patching the existing NPM on my system, or are you shipping a custom NPM alongside it that I'm now using instead? Which one of those two is true? So arborist hasn't changed in years, luckily. So we're actually monkey patching. We're not doing it on disk. We're not modifying it. So you can okay. still use your normal NPM. Okay. But we are monkey patching it if you go through the wrapper. And this gets a little more complicated we actually ship a shim that will alias the npm and mpx commands. There's like a little bin folder inside of ours, but we don't actually ship vendored versions of npm. These little shims, we put them on your path variable. So there are some cases where tools are trying to muck with your path. And we check that our npm is still on the path and if you call into this shim, it will monkey patch NPM right before it runs in memory. It doesn't mess with your NPM at all. You can, you can have them both running next to each other. And, and if you don't do the alias trick that we talked about, then you can just decide if you want to run NPM install or socket NPM install. You can have them both. When we call it a wrapper, though, you're actually wrapping a different version of NPM than the one that's on my disk or you're taking, no, you are, you're shimming the one on my disk and changing it at runtime to operate yes. a little differently. Okay. We are using the one on your machine. So it works, I think on anything that's not end of life. Did you have to do anything specific with regards to windows? You know, NPM is famously has great windows support. One of the reasons why I think it took off as a, as an ecosystem was that windows developers could do lots of node things. Was there anything that you guys had to do for Windows support, or was it just kind of baked into the cake? We actually had to disable Windows support because we found some bugs. So NPM, when you run commands on Windows, and particularly the standard way you interact with cmd.exe, it creates wrapper files, these .bat files, which use some like more complicated than I enjoy shell scripting in order to just invoke the proper command. So we actually looked at how we could support Windows and we cannot programmatically safely, that's the key word, invoke those shell scripts to see what they're actually about to run. So it's not supported for now, unfortunately, but we haven't had any requests to add support for it either. But to be clear, we support Windows subsystem for Linux. So that's what most people are. Most people are using WSL, right? So it'll work fine on that. I think that's why we haven't had any requests yet. Does it work if you bundle NPM with your, with your app? <laughs> so if, if I have, if I got a library or an app and I've added NPM as a dependency, because I want control over what, because my thing wants to run NPM. I want control over what version of NPM I'm running. And so how you do that, you depend on a version of NPM, right? Is safe NPM going to gonna hop in there? Or is that going to be like, mm, I don't know about that. As long as the NPM in question is in the path as NPM, it should intercept it. I mean, it'll be in, in node modules NPM. Yeah, but it has to be in the path. Like You'd have to basically change your script to run socket NPM instead of your, NP, your local NPM, I think. Not normally. If you like were running it by requiring it from node modules, it's not going to patch that. But if you run it from the command line, it should in all normal cases. We actually go out of our way to like try to make sure your path looks correct. Today's extreme edge case brought to you by Chris Hiller. <laughs> Chris, is this something you're doing? Uh, I've considered it. It's okay. on the table. 
<laughs> it's on the table. <laughs> if it isn't working, let us know, because that one should be working. I mean, it's yeah. the, that NPM is not going to be in the path, so it shouldn't work, right? If you use any sort of NPM run, it will be in your path. Nope. <laughs> anyway, so don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to... Yeah. Give it a try, Chris, and let them know. I mean, I, it's just, you know. Also know that NPM's bin directory is now considered deprecated. So don't rely on that. All right, guys. Are there any other interesting implementation details, dragons that you uncovered and slayed, slew? I don't know. Slew them in order to accomplish <laughs> this? <Is> there, <laughs> or what? Is there anything else left on the table that we have to pick up and chew on? Uh, there's certainly stuff still left on the table for us to do. We got a bunch of specific requests on like edge cases, particularly around installations from Git repositories. We saw some interesting oddities there. Like you can't ignore scripts from Git dependencies, even if you use like npm's configuration to ignore scripts. Like it'll run them anyway and stuff like that. So we could do better there. Some people want a bunch more configuration options. All right. For us, any, uh, anything else that we haven't asked about this cool new tool? No, I just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just glad we got it out. It's been a, uh, one of the things I wanted to, I wanted us to build since the beginning of socket because it always felt like a gap in, you know, we're trying to stop malware, but we, we, we we're stopping it in your pull requests and not, right. not on your local machine. So it's been, um, it's been like, just one of those things we wanted to do, but we never really had the time to just like sit down and, and do it. And now that we did, it's, it's like, it's great. Yeah. People really seem to like it and I wish we did it sooner, but, um, better late than never. So, yeah. Awesome. Chris, are you going to give this a try? Are you going to use this tool? Are you, are you too jaded? What, what's your, <laughs> no, I mean, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. yeah. All right. I want like a, like a, like a VS code, Plugin, and I want it. I want it when I open my package JSON file. I want it to show squigglies and stuff oh. of the stuff that's bad from Socket. Okay, just get on that. So feature requests coming at you guys. I don't know. Just go to the marketplace and install it. Oh, it's already there. It exists. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Those are the best kind of feature requests. You know, <laughs> love it. And they already exist. Yeah, squigglies. Bradley also wrote our VS Code extension. So okay. Submit your bug reports to Bradley on that one as well. Keep them, <laughs> off, keep them off Frost's desk. I really want like usability improvements more than bug reports. Like, because people are running these all day, every day. So, all right. Well, submit your usability improvements to Bradley, not to Frost, was, yeah, I mean, was what I was you, told. If you want to, if you want to, uh, if anyone is interested in, in rolling this out as a default NPM wrapper for their whole company, uh, please get in touch. I, I, we're talking to a few people, a few customers that want to do this. Uh, so we'd love to understand the use case more. Uh, but we've gotten interest from people who just said, we just want to, you know, on our default developer image on all new, you know, all new laptops, just like, you know, give everybody the wrapper so that their NPM, you know, gets the, gets that protection. I know smaller companies don't don't usually do that type of stuff, but larger companies do have lots of you know software running on the on the developer machine, usually for security stuff. So uh, right. if anyone's interested in that, like please reach out to us, and and uh, we'd love to learn more about how you'd want to do that and help support it. Very cool, guys. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Bradley, uh, Chris, and Faraz. It's always a pleasure. Of course, all the links to all the things that we referenced on today's show will be in your show notes. That's JS Party for this week, and we'll catch you on the next one. ChangeLog++ Plus Plus members, stick around. We have a fun after-show bonus. More on Yarn, analyzing Node's response to Dino, and a spicy take by Brad about Bun versus Dino. Ah, uh, you know what? I'm going to let everyone listen to this one. If you aren't a Plus Plus member, find one near you and thank them for sharing the love. Or do the entire Changelog community a solid and sign up today. As a thanks for your support, 
We make the ads disappear, include regular bonuses like the one you're about to hear, and more. Check it out at changelog.com slash plus plus. Shout out to our partners. We have Fastly serving static assets, Fly on dynamic requests, Brake Master Cylinder on beats, and you making everything we do worthwhile. We appreciate you listening each and every week. Next up on the pod, front end feud reigning champ Adam Argyle is back. Not to feud, though there's more where that came from. This time he's talking with Nick and Amelia about all the new hotness in CSS colors. He even has a new gradient tool to announce for the first time right here on JS Party. Stay tuned for that. We'll have it ready for you next week. I'm a yarn user, so sorry guys. <laughs> Not that I really have a preference to yarn. It was like when it first came out, it was so much faster that we just switched over to it. And I think NPM is probably just about as fast now because they like did a bunch of work after that. And now it just bugs me that I have to use yarn because I have I use NPM on so many like small things. And then on our main project, I have to remember how to use yarn. And then I'm like, what's it? Yarn I instead of this or yarn add. Can you switch know. back easily, or is it is it too integrated at this point? No, I can switch back. It's just like inertia based. It's a huge, huge amount of effort to make this work with yarn. Yeah, I would almost just like wait it out. You know, maybe eventually, well, all all of us yarn people will be dead or moved on. I don't know. Because there's also Bun now too, which we talk to them, all sorts of people. And um, what's the other one? Uh, Dino, yeah. Also Dino, which no. is all... I is... guess they do package JSON now. Yeah, yeah Dino's a, a whole other ball of wax. I think Yarn got so much help from... Um, they got really... The adoption really started when NPM was kind of... And it's, there was like a little bad period where yeah. not much was happening. And it was this really good competition that showed up that was like, well, why is NPM not deterministic and why is it slow and let's fix all this? And, and then yeah. it, it, that competition made them up their game. And now a lot of the benefit, like workspaces and all that stuff was, was really good. And then now right. a lot of those reasons have gone away. But yeah, I don't know. I'm not a really a Yarn user, so I don't know what other reasons people would use it for as well. But Right. Well, I'll tell you, I told you what mine was. It was a straight up, I was in that malaise where it was like, why is this taking so long? And I was like, oh, another tool that does the same thing, but faster, easy switch over. I was just like, let's do this. And then I just stayed there. I wonder if like, is that going to be the Dino story? You know, is it going to be like Dino came in and made Node do a bunch of stuff and now they stepped up to the plate and Node got better and Dino kind of just like stayed fringe or or not? I don't know. I don't think Node has done anything in response to Dino. No? I mean, they've done a bunch. They have the HTTPS imports, but it's flagged due to, like, nightmare-level security problems of just that security model. We have the permissions model gets unflagged this month for all those, like... They have web APIs, like the file API, blobs and stuff. Um Fetch. I mean, they, I don't they know. They got a lot now. The test runner. But I think I think that's the problem of being the differentiating features. We do this, but more. You're just telling the original people to ship more. You're not. You're not really bringing something new to the table. Brand new. Yeah. But if they were stink, yeah, maybe maybe they. That's just that just means they need to go faster and add more stuff and just be ahead. Right. Well, they've had to carve backward. They just added package JSON. That's right. They did. I asked Ryan that when he was on the show about, you know, I feel like what you could come out and say is like, with Dino, you can build this type of application that you can't build with Node. Like, it actually has something that's new and different that's like, actually, you're going to need a Dino thing to get that done. Does it have anything like that? And it was, it was more like, no. It's like, he's like, you can build anything in the world you want with Node. It's just like, this is me doing Node the right way or what I think is a better way. And so it's like better Node. It's not like, by the way, there's a brand new class of apps. Like that's the kind of stuff that's, I think, more disruptive, right? Versus like just more or just different or just be- better in certain minuscule ways that can be easily caught up to by effort. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that, isn't that the story of all of JavaScript, right? It's like, you know, like people have always said, well, if we could just do it over, 
and do it the right way, wouldn't everything be better? Like, why are we using this bad language? Or, you know, there's always that, that, that sure. like argument. And then it's always never really panned out for those people. I'm not saying that's exactly the argument he was making, but it sounds right. a little like it. I mean, like no one really cares about the warts in the language that much to like switch everything over to something new. If that's the only benefit is that, oh, you know, it's like nicer in some aesthetic way. That's not really going to make a difference for people enough. It needs to be like 10 X better to like right. get over that, in that inertia. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mic honestly, drop moment. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I think bun's going to just be the biggest problem for Dino because it's going to steal some of their inertia, their, their intention. So Dino requires you to have a greenfield project to really excel it requires you to write something that doesn't have as many tutorials. It also requires you to have this security system that you always have to disable in production for the most part. It's just a very strange thing. And then Bun came along and was like, okay, we're going to take the TypeScript integration idea. We're going to take the not node modules install thing to speed it up. And we're just going to strap that onto Node. And that is a much more compelling thing than having to rewrite any sort of software. Mm -hmm. like, well, I mean, taking a cue from TypeScript's playbook, right? Like the fact that it's a superset and it's just adoptable in a way, you don't have to rewrite anything. Like you're literally already using it. One of the reasons why people were like, oh, okay, I can just change this to .ts or not even have to do that and try this out, that's a huge advantage for any sort of adoption is like, well, be a superset or be the same or be API compatible. It's much harder to start brand new. I mean, but you get more radical ideas that way, I guess, you know, assuming that your ideas are radical in the first place. Change log plus plus. It's better. Beep.